Good morning, everybody. And when I say good morning, it's, well, it's not that early. It's only six o'clock in the morning. So my name is Carolyn D. Flores. I am an author and an illustrator. And I was going to be there in McAllen to give a lecture and a watercolor workshop, a hands-on watercolor workshop to you guys. But because of everything that's happened, we can't be together in person. So uh, your school asked if I could do this presentation for my studio. And, and at first I was thinking, man, it's really too bad that we can't do the watercolor stuff together and have you guys paint with, I was gonna bring paints and, and show you some of the techniques I use with brushes. But then I thought, this might be a really good chance to show you guys something that most people never get a chance to see. And that is the actual equipment. Believe me, I have many times thought about taking tons of equipment on the road because I do a lot of school visits. I do a lot of lectures, but it's just, it's just too cumbersome. There's just no way. However, because we're doing it this way, I thought we could concentrate on illustration tools because to be quite honest that's what inspires me a lot and I think it inspires a lot of artists and I think it's going to give you a better feel for what illustration is all about because it's not the act of illustration but it certainly has a lot to do with how we accomplish the illustrations so for those of you that don't know very much about me, I'm a children's illustrator. I've done or contributed to about 17 books. I'm mostly known for picture books. And my biggest book, I think, is a book called The Amazing Watercolor Fish. And I'm very proud of this book. It took me 10 years to do this book. I did the illustrations and I wrote it. And we have the Spanish translation by Dr. Carmen Tafoya, who was our state poet laureate. So one of the reasons I'm so proud of this book is because it is the very first picture book in the world, as far as we know. Well, it certainly is the very first picture book published traditionally to rhyme in both Spanish and English. So that was a very big deal. And I absolutely love this book. And I'm going to read it to you in just a bit. This is going to be our example for watercolor. Now for watercolor, I, I studied with a man named E.B. Lewis, who is a very famous children's illustrator. And he has, I think, three Caldecott honors and many Coretta Scott King awards. And I studied with him like we are doing here via Skype. This isn't Skype, this is just a, uh, a recording, but uh, every week for half an hour, we would paint together and he would look over on my computer and see the st stuff that I was doing and he'd be like, no, that color's just a little too harsh or this is how you make a mark. And, and it, was, it was really, really a big deal for me. So I think I picked up a lot of stuff about watercolor and I'm gonna show you that stuff in just a little bit. Um, another book that I did that I'm very proud of is a surprise for Teresita. This was written by Virginia Sanchez Coral, who is an amazing lady. She lives in New Jersey, I think, but she's in New York. I love this because I developed a technique to enable myself to paint this, which is oil on cardboard. One of the reasons most people don't use oil for illustrations is because it takes so long to dry. I'm used to doing these big, huge, you know, I used to do these uh, abstract, big paintings or uh, also these big, huge portraits. Ab abstract expressionism is what we used to call it. Mm. I used to do these huge portraits. They would take like a year or a year and a half to dry. But I stumbled onto something which enabled us to do these paintings so that the, the oil dry within 45 minutes. That enables us to scan them in. 
okay, which is a really important part of illustration. I really love this book, and I'm going to show you some of the originals from this, and this is this is really cool, and nobody ever gets a chance to see those. Oh my gosh, I think I have this one, so we'll, we'll compare it to the actual print in the book. Okay, one of the other books that I did that we're going to talk about is Sing Froggy Sing, and this was my first book, first published book. And this was done exclusively in Prismacolor colored pencil. And so we'll be talking about that. I'm very proud of this cover. I think it's in a museum, actually, the original. But, oh my gosh. I remember working on this and every single mark was just so full of love, you know? So we're going to talk about illustrating in Prismacolor colored pencil, or colored pencil in general. And we'll talk about papers. And the reason I'm, I'm kind of going over all of these mediums and also the writing utensils that we use is because I, I do want you to get a feel for the idea that you're conveying your DNA you know, through your fingers, through these instruments, onto the paper, and that it's very important that uh, you create an environment, a work environment, that enables you to just concentrate on, on the art, on the concept, on the world that you're in. You'll find that it is very important to be prepared for whatever you're going to do ahead of time so that, for instance, if you have a palette with your oil and it's dabbed the way you need it to be, when you're painting that little detail and you go back to try to find a color or try to find something, you're not going to be drifting away from that point of thought. You're not going to be losing that moment because it's right there. It's almost second nature. You know, your hand goes where it should. And that's the way I try to make sure my studio is so that whenever I'm working on something, even right now I'm working on a novel. I'm working on a novel called Lineage, right? And so for me, because I'm an artist as well, it was really important for me to have really good pens. Now I know that sounds like a little bit extreme, but when I say, I mean, because when I say pens, I mean really good pens. Most of these pens I actually put together myself from different other really good pens. This is partly platinum and it's also a uh, jean. I mean, I, I just kind of put it together with different nibs and things like that. This is a Jinhao nib, uh, 18 karat. But, I mean, this thing works so beautifully. And I actually made this, I made this ink stand. My husband had this, this ink pot from, I don't know, like 40 years ago. I cleaned it out and I'm using it now for the for the black ink that I use on the book, which is this. By the way, this Takesumi is awesome and it's half the price of like the Mont Blanc and all that kind of stuff. And it's it's better, I think. So I, I put this on here. This is actually a uh, windshield for a mic, for a sure mic. And we glued it on here. And this was actually a reed cap. And so I put my pens in here when I'm working so I can go directly for the pen that I need to write that thought at that moment that I have it. And I, and I love these pens because they're all, oh my gosh, this is an antique pen that I absolutely adore. See, just a piece of pipe. But I think you'll find that really taking care of your equipment and really being careful with your ink and really being careful with your pencils and understanding them will really help you. Now you're probably asking what difference does that make? The reason it makes a difference is this. As artists, we want to 
first of all, push the envelope of, of marks on paper or uh, the physical piece of art that can communicate to somebody else. And in order to do that, we have to have writing utensils and, and paint brushes and paints that are just an extension of our body. It may not seem like a big deal, but this is as much a part of your work as anything else. Uh, a lady that I admire greatly, her name is Linda Sue Park. She's a Newberry medalist, which means she had the best written book in English book that year for a, a book titled uh, A Single Shard, which is an amazing book. You should read it if you haven't already read it. And she said, you should be to the point where when you put your fingers on the typewriter or the computer keyboard, it's second nature. The thoughts are just flowing. She said, and even the act of picking up a pen or the act of just putting your fingers on the keyboard actually generates creative thought because it's just so, you know, in tune with your body. So I think it is very important that we understand that and that you make your equipment, your art equipment, your mediums, your own. You know, I never want to pick up a pencil and be told how I'm supposed to use it. I want to take a pencil, sometimes I even make my own, and do what it is I want to do with the pencil, even if I have to invent it myself. And I think most artists are that way. As a matter of fact, in my book, Lineage, there's a chapter on an artist named Albrecht Durer. And, uh, he was around at the same time as Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, and Michelangelo thought he was the best artist in the world at that time. It was really amazing to me when I read about Albert Dura because they said he could not keep his finger still. He was constantly drawing, constantly sketching. He was the first person actually to use the modern watercolors, the very first. And his thing was that he, you know, uh, had recipes for ink. He made his own brushes. He made his own pens. Everything was made by him. And I think that that adds a real grandeur to your work. So let's get started. Okay. A after we talk about the art techniques, I really want to talk about basic illustration, which is the design and what entails, especially a picture book because there is a specific format. Okay, so are we ready? Let's get started with my, one of my favorites, Prismacolor pencils. Okay, that'll come next. Okay, so here I am back. And so I went and got a few examples of, of Prismacolor stuff. First of all, I wanted to talk about the paper that I use for Prismacolor. People use different types of paper, but I love using this graphics paper. It comes with, I think nowadays, it comes with a, a kind of a shiny side on one side and, uh, and a frosted side on the other. And the side that I use for Prismacolor is the frosted side. And so I buy almost all of my paper, including watercolor paper, in huge, rolls and these come in these huge rolls and as you use them you know you just cut them with a blade and then uh, cut them to the size that you need so this this starts off with graphics paper at least for me i started using this with my first picture book for art of Publico, which was called uh, sing froggy sing canta Rana canta and here it is and I was really excited about using these kinds of really deep and vibrant greens and blues. That is why I selected Prismacolor. And then at that time, I did interviews with different people and I told everybody that I would never use any other art form or any other art medium. I would never use any other uh, 
rendering except for Prismacolor, which of course I, I did not stick to. But man, I remember working on this piece right here and it's just the, the frog and you can see thinking before it starts. You know, this is a very musical frog. It's uh, a singing frog. And so let's just talk a little bit about, about the idea of creating your character in a book. When I got the contract for this book, actually, I got a contract for another book the very same day. The, the two contracts came within 45 minutes of each other, and that started off my career. And I was kind of in shock because, because I was really, really trying to get a, a publishing contract, and they came, I mean, like within an hour of each other. So this was one of them, Sing Froggy Sing. And so right away, the very first thing I did was go out and start doing research on frogs. My husband took a picture of me. I had, I went to the library and brought back books on frogs, frog skeletons, what frogs did, where they lived, you know, the uh, coloring of frogs. And I also did research on singers, particularly opera singers. So if you uh, see this book, uh, the frog always looks like it's, operatic right because i had this this vision of an operatic frog and um and so i actually went and found ponds and found places that had you know lily pads and i would get into the water with my cameras and and i really studied lily pads and it was really wonderful and we can talk about uh skeletons and, and the underlying parts of character if we have time at the end but right now, I want to talk about Prismacolor. Okay, so uh, there are two types of Prismacolor that I used back then, and I still use them occasionally. And one is called Premier. So this is, uh, I, I have like an entire, like, I don't know, like 17 drawers of Prismacolor pencils. And I, I just pulled out three it's because I keep them in this kind of an order so that I can, can go to them very quickly. And also because it keeps my inventory for me. So I can see when I'm running low on a particular color. Because believe me, if you use a certain palette and a certain color in a book, you'll use, I don't know, you'll go through 12 of that pencil, you know, throughout that book. By the way, a book, a picture book, is almost always 32 pages. Uh, almost always. And so... Um, that turns out to be with the title page and the end page and the publisher's info and the uh, uh, end pages and all of that, it comes out to 14 spreads. A spread is this. A spread is when you have, well, this is a very good spread, my very first one. Okay, so this is a spread. When you have uh, a picture that grows across the middle of the book like this which is called a gutter uh, when it crosses over and the picture takes both pages that you can see that's a spread when it's only on one page this is another spread um, when it is only on one side it is a single page illustration uh, I did a lot of spreads in this one because I do like spreads uh, this would be kind of a, a single page illustration. It's actually got to bleed back onto the other page. This book actually has what we call a wordless spread. And I was really excited to do that. Uh, and I pitched it to the publisher and they loved it. So we did it. And uh, you don't often get a chance to do a wordless spread. It should be closer. Here we go. It's not even a wordless spread. This is actually what we call spot illustrations a spot illustration, a spot illustration, and a single page illustration. So this is a good good uh, example of, of those types of illustrations. Okay, so those are the types of illustrations you generally have in a picture book. Okay, so I have drawers and drawers of these Prismacolors. I also have drawers of what we call Prismacolor Verithins. And those are the colored pencils uh, that have very hard... Um, uh, leads. Okay, there's uh, 
less graphite in them. There's less uh, carbon or whatever it is that makes them soft. And so you use those for the hard edges on things. And I used to use those quite a lot. However, what I decided to do was uh, I started coring my pencils, which means I started taking the pencils and taking the leads out, especially the uh, the harder leads, the Verithins, and I started putting them in lead pointers so I could get a really, really, really uh, great, great, uh, very fine, sharp tip for some of the stuff I was working on. And uh, uh, I actually called Prismacolor and asked them if they would uh, just sell me the leads and they said no. <laughs> <laughs> but they were very interested for a while in that idea, but uh, they, they, they wouldn't do that for me. So I kind of ended up making my own pencils. But um, the thing about Prismacolor, and uh, kids really love this when I show it to them. I, don't, I have very few of the original illustrations. Uh, people buy the illustrations, so um, I don't have a lot of them here in the studio but I did find this one just a minute ago and it's uh it'll give you an example you can kind of see through it a little bit see you can see the light through it and you can see uh it's kind of a wax and uh I would show kids I would do stuff like this I would uh let me put it up against something kind of draw a little bit do this and I would tell them be really careful because uh so let me find an eraser here somewhere um, I, well, my racers over here. I'd say be really careful because it's pencil and I can't, I can't replace that illustration. So, and of course I don't have a single eraser open. So let me, let me cut it open real quickly. And close this so nobody gets hurt. Okay, so as you can see I drew that and right now I'm going to erase it just to show you that it is actually pencil. So there you go. Now, when I draw uh, or paint, I always mount the, um, the paper that I'm going to work on. And so this was a really good example of that. Um, so I found this. I don't think this even made the book, but I usually use just a piece of foam board and I mount it on that. I use uh, painter's tape around. I've already taken it off here and uh, kind of put it down just like watercolor paper. And that's how I do my stuff. Of course, uh, for this kind of stuff, I would do the originals in pencil. And so let's talk about pencil for a minute. Now, depending on what kind of pencil you like, um, you know, you have to have something that you're really comfortable with. I like a very soft pencil. As a matter of fact, by uh, within the past few years, I'm actually using almost straight, straight, uh, you know, woodless, graphite and this is a, a hard myth progressa which I love I, this is a 4b and I have I have drawers of just 4b's and 6b's because I just love them and I can sketch you know any way I want and it can be very loose and so I love uh, this particular pencil but uh, I also love for just regular drawing and this is a very short one my Tombos okay so the Tombos uh, this is a 6 beat because I like to use really, really uh, loose, um, soft pencils when I'm sketching. Um, and also I like to use them for shading. Uh, the Tombow for me is really great. I've tried a lot of different pencils. A lot of people like Coran Diash and, and uh, just all sorts of other pencils. But a Tombow for me is, is the one. So I have just drawers of this as well. Um, also... When I'm sketching my ideas, and I sketch all the time, always sketching ideas, it's really weird because I use really big paper, sometimes these big pads that you see, you know, in schools and stuff, sometimes just big poster paper. And I'm always sketching with Copics. Now, uh, Copics have, you know, um, they have two sides to them. I always use the chiseled side, which is why I tape down the uh, brush side. And I have refills for this. And so when I'm coming up with ideas, I like to be just just doing it really big. And so before I, you know, a lot of people start with little tiny thumbnails. I start with big gestural sketches. 
And uh, so I'll take out a poster board and I'm starting to just kind of play with the character, play with the environment, play with the world that I'm in. And I'm just sketching, sketching emotions, sketching ideas and stuff like that. And uh, so I have just a, just a wonderful array of uh, Copic pen, pens that I just absolutely love. Uh, now, that's me. I'm not trying to say everybody has to use a Copic, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, I have a friend who, uh, his name is, well, his official, his art, art name, his author name is Raul III. And he has done uh, this series of books, uh, illustrated this series of books called Low Riders in Outer Space. And won all sorts of awards. He won a Budapest medal, I think, for those books. Um, he uses ballpoint pen. And I remember he was telling, you know, uh, he said, yeah, I just buy those really, you know, inexpensive ballpoint pen, the green and the blue and the red, and that's how I do my, my uh, illustrations. And my husband said, well, you know, uh, you know, we spend so much money on, on equipment and uh, Raul just uses the, uh, the ballpoints. And then Raul said, uh, well, that's not exactly true. Uh, he does just use the ballpoints, but they have so that there's so that so much resistance that um, his hands cramp up, and he actually has somebody after every session of drawing come in and massage his hands so that uh, so that he can still use them, so that he can still draw every day, and that's very expensive. So you know, um, it's it's whatever is an extension of your soul that's that's the uh the writing uh, utensil you want to use uh that's the you know that's all part of the craft you know you don't ever want to be certainly when i'm writing something or when i'm sketching i don't want to be thinking about working the pen i want whatever's in my head to come out right and um because you're going to have a lot you have a lot of restrictions already, so you don't want to be concerned with, you know, physical technical restrictions, right? You just want it to be, you want to be one with the paper, one with the, with the pen, one with the brush. So this is Prismacolor. Let's talk about oil. Okay, that's up next. How's that, how's that look? Oh, it's already recording. Okay, so, um, all right, so we're here to talk about oil. And uh, so I brought you in oil. Now, I don't want you to think I always paint myself, um, but for, there was a, 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 um, a gallery, a, um, an art show, where they wanted uh, us to paint self-portraits. And so this was mine. And I painted myself in black and white and the uh, um, rest of the world in color because that's the way I saw my life. I really like the idea of just, um, you know, the creativity coming out rather than, you know, uh, towards me. So uh, this was what I did. Uh, this is, so this is oil on canvas, which is what I'm used to painting. So this is not a really good way to present it, but here we go. So this is <laughs> sadly up in our, our living room. All right, so that gives you an idea of what I used to do, mostly because the background is what we call abstract expressionism. And I was used to making these huge paintings that were abstract expressionism paintings. Um, I also did huge, huge um, pieces that were like scrims, uh, and they were like maybe 40 feet by 20 feet, or, or huge walls that were maybe, say, 12 feet by 20 feet. So I used to do really big pieces. And uh, so I was very, very used to oil. I come from fine art and oil was my medium and I still love oil very much. And so um, I wasn't gonna get, we, ha we have tubs of oils, but I can kind of just give you uh, an example of the two oils I use. Now, I, actually I have a lot of different types, but these in particular are Windsor uh, Newton and this is cadmium orange and uh, this is just a raw umber and uh, this is a burnt sienna. So um, I have this, uh, I have these cups 
and generally you, you see gel in detail. This is what I came up with when I was working on a book called uh, Surprise for, better see them, I love this book. I absolutely love this book. And if you can see, I'm gonna pull this forward, but this is oil on uh, cardboard. And it, as if you look closely enough, you'll see that the lines uh, that are generally done in pencil are actually just left blank, almost like a reverse engraving. So like the, uh, the lines on the face are actually just the cardboard showing through. And I really, really loved that idea. I, I uh, picked uh, oil on cardboard specifically for this book because this book is about a, a New Yorkian uh, neighborhood in New York. And uh, uh, I actually went to New York and took pictures of the buildings there. And it, they were just so colorful and so wonderful that I wanted the book itself to be kind of a, a physical manifestation of a building. And you can kind of see that I did that a little bit on the back but it didn't really translate the way I saw it in my head. But the idea was going to be that the whole book was a, was a building, right? And, uh, and in the end, when they go into the party, that they were going to just walk into this book, right? But, uh, you know, things change. And it didn't, it didn't come out the way... I, it, it didn't communicate the way I thought it would. And that happens sometimes. But I still really loved this idea of oil on cardboard because it really made these colors pop. And uh, I thought that was really necessary to, to convey the culture and the neighborhood of this book. Um, so I also thought it really gave a real softness to the mother and the daughter. And I love, for some reason, I love the idea of mothers in my books. And so it's always, these are always really great moments. And as you can see, the outline is just the cardboard showing through. So my, my problem with oil, though, for an illustration, was that oil does not dry. Oil does not dry very quickly. And uh, I, I knew this because I'd had, I had paintings that we put up on the wall and they were still wet six months, eight months later. So um, uh, I had to come up with something that would work. And uh, while I was kind of toying with that idea in my head, I also wanted to come up with a way to uh, make what we call like a, an illustration cell um, easel, like one of those rotating easels that you see in an animation studio. And so I accidentally stumbled upon the answer to my problem. So uh, I just was gonna show you some of the bristle brushes I use. Uh, this is a set from the tub, from the oil tub. So um, I'm not going to show you all the brushes, but I grabbed this just a minute ago. And uh, let's show you what happened. So first of all, I drew my sketches on this um, chipboard. And I tried a lot of different types of uh, cardboard, and this was the best. Um, eventually, we ended up ordering this from Walmart. They actually sell it, and we've got it in these big stacks. But uh, what I started out on first was just the backs of tablets. And, uh, uh, but I wanted a really consistent, good chipboard, and this seemed to be the best. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring it up to you. This was not used in the book, but you can see the outlines. And, uh, and I did another version of this in the book. But uh, see, so you can see the, uh, the, the, the pencil. And you can see where I started, you know, just uh, getting the color on there. And I'll show you how I did this in just a minute. But... So basically, I had my canvas, which was the cardboard, and I needed to mount it. So I came up with this, and uh, my husband just went and got this for me. And so here is the easel. I'm gonna move these paints over to here and here, and kind of move this brush over to these brushes over to, and I'm gonna show you what I came up with. Now, I actually got this easel for like 20 bucks. And, uh, you know, it's just like the most basic easel that you can get at the, uh, at the, um, I mean, the art store. And, uh, and I kind of just changed it so that I would be able to use it. So here's the easel. And what I did was I took the bottom of what's called a Lazy Susan. It's kind of this 
spinning like tray for chips and I took the bottom of it and I asked my husband I said is there any way we can put it on there so it still spins and he said yeah and he just put a put a screw in there actually that's actually coming loose now it's been like oh, it's been many many years okay so he put it in like this and as you can see you can adjust uh, the holder like this and I'm gonna I'm gonna have this stand up and what we ended up doing was we ended up taking that uh, chipboard okay and mounting it on foam board and I used this circle to make a circle in the middle of the foam board okay and I used painters tape to tape the cardboard to this square it's 12 inches by 12 inches so that I would be able to mount it like this and then turn it as I'm painting because the thing with oil is it doesn't dry right so you have to paint it sometimes using um, just a little bridge and you're painting and uh, you know it's not like you can put your your hand down there or it's just gonna it's just gonna destroy the painting so I created this so I would be able to work in detail on the on on each illustration and I was painting this particular book to scale so this would be the exact same size as the illustration in the book uh, but what happened was something very very cool and I'm hoping that you can see this because I'm I'm uh, recording this kind of on the fly but uh, the thing is because there's air back here and because it spins like this what happened was when I painted the oil on the cardboard and I would dip it into a thing called liquid to kind of make the details uh, flow a little bit better and and it's 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 a dryer right but I mean it's not that fast of a dryer what happened was something very weird the uh, I think I was working on one of these pieces and my hand accidentally slipped and no paint came up and I was like what the heck is going on and um, so I just thought it was maybe drying really fast so we scanned it and sure enough no no paint got on the scanner and we were able to scan illustrations within 45 minutes of painting them but what was really happening was this uh, I guess a, a few months later there was a piece that I was working on that I didn't like and and I uh, tore it to do something else with it and it was still wet this was months later and I thought whoa what had happened was it kind of shellacked on top and created a a, a hard film a, a clear film that uh, that actually kind of gave the depth to the oil painting and uh, so in 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 reality the oil hadn't dried at all but it was scannable and that's what you need for an illustration so we were really proud of that and uh, and then I ended up patenting that because uh, not because I was trying to control it but because I didn't want anybody to keep me from using it later and uh, so it just it just worked for us and I'm really I'm really proud of of the way these came out especially because um, with that shellac I was able to paint and then really really get these uh, these lighter colors and make it almost look crystalline so if you look at uh, if you look at like my example here and originally this was mounted like the other one you can see how that worked it almost looks metallic and I was really really happy with it I was really really happy with the way the buildings were rendered as well so uh, I've just loved working in oil and at that time I thought I will never do anything else but work in oil for picture books and I was wrong again so next up the amazing water color fish <laughs> my favorite so that's coming thanks guys this is so cool because that's the first time that's happened okay so uh, let's talk about watercolor and uh, this is really exciting because I've never had uh, anyone really in the studio where I'm showing them all of the, the really cool like you know paints and stuff um, but I, I absolutely love see I'm getting chills I love my watercolors uh, I love color period um, I've always kind of considered myself a colorist 
And so one of my biggest challenges when I first started as an illustrator was to make sure that my uh, aptitude for color came across, that, that my DNA came across in my paintings. Because it doesn't always, you know, you don't always uh, communicate the thing that you're best at uh, in your illustrations when you're first starting. And that has to do with developing your voice. And so I think for me, uh, my palette is very me. And, uh, and at first I, I didn't think I would be able to kind of, um, you know, uh, reach uh, my palette with watercolor, but I was really, really wrong. I love watercolor. I, um, I, I make these kinds of palettes out of the tube paints and uh, I pick a lot of different ones. I have a, a you know, I, uh, Old Holland and, uh, and I used to use Winter and Newton and I use, uh, uh, gee, uh, just a whole bunch. It just depends on saint -Lier, you know. Um, whatever, uh, it, the brand doesn't matter. It's really about that particular paint that can make my particular palette. And so I usually make these master, master sets, uh, especially when it, uh, for a book, so that I can, you know, just pick this area out when I'm doing, say, the uh, red fish of Ashley, or, you know, the green, uh, the green uh, uh, Mikey in the book. The reason I, I brought these two out was because these are watercolors, which were the very first drawings and uh, watercolors I did where I captured the character. So this is the very first painting of Mikey. And I absolutely love it. Um, and this one is the very first rendering of Ashley. So I was just kind of trying to play around with her form and I wanted her to be very, uh, I don't know, just very girlish and very uh, sleek like that and, you know, frilly and uh, just imaginative and sweet. And uh, so there she is, you know, I just really love, love her. Um, so, um, so I played around a lot with the, uh, with the form. And if, if you look really closely at the, uh, at the, at the drawings, they're just very loose sketches, right? That I did in, uh, probably Tombow pencil. And then I came in and started experimenting with color. The thing is though, um, it, it, and I just need to throw one other thing in. When I first started doing school visits with the uh, with the watercolor fish, uh, I took these two these exact two pieces with me, and I kind of put them up on a stand when I went to talk to the librarian and stuff. And when I came back, these little kids were walking up to the uh, to the pictures, and they were like, "Hi, Ashley. Hi, Mikey. My name is Jasmine." And I was like, "Whoa!" I mean, they they really connected with the characters, and it just it was just a thrilling, thrilling moment for me. Uh, and that happened <laughs> again and again, uh, you know, whenever I took the pictures out. So what I want to show you about watercolor itself is this. Uh, with watercolor, the paper really matters. I use arches, and this is a really heavy arches. As a matter of fact, at one time, I think I could actually stand it on end, and it would stand. It was, it was, it's really heavy. Um, I like the way that, uh, this is, this is actually, uh, a cold press. And so it's a little bit rougher, but, uh, I love the way that it, it absorbs the color and it just saturates it. It almost starts to look like felt. And, uh, and I just really just, just love the way the water flowed on it. So, um, so basically you take these pieces and they're all, you know, they've got the deckling on the side, so they're all torn like this. I mean, I tore it myself, but, uh, and I mount it again on really hard foam board and I tape it down and I keep it taped for the duration of the painting, right? So that, uh, so that it doesn't buckle with water when you're painting on it. Although this heavy of a paper really doesn't buckle very much at all, or, you know, or warp, but, uh, I just, you just really love the feel of this with your brush. And so on this, I think I was just using uh, what we call hot press. I think it's like 170 or something like that. Uh, for, you know, you can tell I just cut pieces out and was drawing. And so I, I uh, use that and I really, you can see that it's a lot finer 
uh, hot press is very smooth and it takes um, it takes detail much better and so I was able to you know kind of play with this metallic -y kind of idea that I had for Mikey and uh, but I'm really really proud of it and you can see I always made my notes I don't know if you can see that but I made notes with my uh, with my um, Prismacolor pencils about palette and things like that as I went along so these were the first character they're not really character sketches but character studies forgot to show you this with the oil but this is what a palette my palettes look like <laughs> you know usually I put uh, um, paints inside the box but I just use the same paper or canvas that I'm using for the painting, I tear off pieces of it and use it for my palette. That goes uh, the same for watercolor. Okay, so another really, really important thing in watercolor is the brush. It is really, really important. And um, so I have a, a set, I have a couple of sets of Series 7, which are really, really fine brushes um, Windsor and Newton brushes that are watercolor brushes and the thing about uh, a series 7 is if you uh, if it's you wet it my other my other phone is going off if you wet it with water and if it's clean and you go like this it should come to a point and it always does so these series 7s are perfect because they hold a lot of water and you can just you know do whatever you want with the detail and and you know if you become skillful you can go right along whatever edge you want and still create these beautiful washes i also have really big series sevens and those are for the really big washes i discovered a brush that i absolutely love and uh and i thought i was like the only person who knew about it and uh it's called a Raphael soft aqua zero and what was really weird about this brush, I don't, I think I got it for free with something and, and I fell in love with it because it is, I think I use this brush for watercolor more than any other brush. As a matter of fact, when, when I have a, a friend that's an illustrator that I really like, I, I, I give them this like for Christmas. But uh, what's really weird about this Raphael, it doesn't look as tapered as the Series uh, 7, but it is... Um, you know, I mean, it holds a tremendous amount of water and it's just really beautiful. It actually does that edge really beautif beautifully because of the way it's cut. Um, and it, it, what's really weird about it is that in all of the catalogs, because I always order these online, they, they, uh, the picture is a, of a white brush with white, you know, uh, bristles or whatever. These aren't really bristles. It's kind of a, a hair that's really just, just wonderful. Um, so don't be fooled if if it's if it says Raphael Soft Aqua Zero, it's a it's a perfect brush. And what's really weird, I thought I was the only person who knew about this. It turns out like I would call my friends. I mean, like the master watercolors, and they they go, "Oh, I'm already using that." I really like, wow, because this is such a great brush. I think I I have ten of them that I use. Okay, so you're thinking. Uh, that's all you need to know about watercolor and, and of course there's so much more about layering and and the same with oil and and I mean there's just there's just worlds of things to learn but for me a really important part of my watercolor world uh, and uh, and you know technique is using play-doh now a lot of people would think this is silly but for me it was really important to uh, create the models for my book and I had a, I have a, 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 a goldfish bowl and I had, I had put pink sand at the bottom. I actually got played on my hair. But what I ended up doing was taking, and I do this for a lot of characters, especially the, uh, the anamorphic ones. Uh, I ended up taking a, a piece of Play-Doh like this. And uh, I was just kind of thinking about the book and what kind of fish I wanted to make because I had studied fish so, I mean, so many types of fish and I'd gotten so into that, that my fish, they weren't coming alive. They weren't, they weren't being what I wanted them to be. They were too, too, uh, uh, referential. They, they, they mimicked real fish too much. And, uh, so I thought maybe I'll just make a, a, a fish that just wants to talk to me. And I, so I took a piece of Play-Doh and I made a, you know, made a uh, ball out of it like this. 
and I put it on a popsicle stick because I always happen to have popsicle sticks in my studio. And I did this and uh, I thought about the form of a fish. And so um, I wanted to create the mouth, the snout basically first. And so I just pulled this like this. So I'm gonna come as close as I can. I pulled this like this and I made it into a little point. And I thought, okay, that we'll start with that, but I turned it this way. And I thought, I need something for the tail. And I kind of made my hand like a claw and I pulled this to make it into kind of a knob and I twisted it like that and then flattened it with my fingers. And I basically had this fan for a, for a tail. Now I wasn't, that's not really the tail I wanted. So I, I just tore it like that. And that's a kind of a shark tail, but okay. So I did that and I saved this piece. And then to create the upper fin, I went like that. And the bottom fin, I did the same thing. And then to create, I wanted the fish to talk to me as I, as I drew it. Because see, the reason I did this was because I'm dyslexic and I need models where you can see the shadow, right? Because I can't remember which side things come from. So if I have something in front of me and it, you know, I just put it in the sand and it's, and I can look at the angle, it, I can see that shadow very easily, you know, make that maybe like a, a maroon red and then maybe make this kind of, you know, brighter. And so what I needed now was the expression of the fish. And so I took a pencil, any pencil, and I went ahead and I made the mouth. And so now the mouth was talking to me, you know, put where I thought the eyes might be. And everyone comes out differently. I mean, you know, they're like talking to you and they're so cute. And I took that little piece of Play-Doh that I had left over and I uh, rolled it like this, like a piece of spaghetti. I don't know if you can see that, but I basically, you know, rolled it with my uh, fingers across the, the desk. And then I wrapped it around the, the opening and I create an expression. So now you have uh, a uh, Play-Doh Amazing Watercolor Fish. And so I created many of these, you know, uh, with different expressions so that I could actually kind of, you know, interact with them while I was drawing and, and painting the book. And uh, they turned out to be the best thing I ever did because I just, it felt like they were alive, you know? And uh, and I, I, I kept all of them. So I have this these big tubs with just, a lot of different types of fish in them. And then I would just be able to sometimes just stand it like that and draw it. So um, so here's, here's the thing that I'm trying to say, especially about watercolor, because generally with watercolor, you're working with worlds, you know, more fantastical worlds where you need some reference because, you know, some people can do it all from their heads, but, but my process and, 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 and uh, from my way of thinking, you need something physical to interact with if you're drawing. Because if you're if if it's all in your head and you're trying to draw it without kind of kind of living in that world, then you might be draining a lot of energy trying to remember little details. When in fact, I mean, you, you of course you want to be free with your drawing and you want to be free with your characters and you want to be free in creating your scene, but. You also don't want to be worrying if you have any sort of detail like sh uh, shadows and shade and, and curves and, and, and you know, um, I mean, just, just anything at all that, that has to do with the direction of the light. You don't want to have to be draining, draining your energy, you know, thinking about that. You want to just, an artist is what they see, you know, and, uh, and I see this with an artist's eyes, not as it is exactly. And I never intended for the fish to be exactly the fish that I drew. I intended it to be something that I saw and and saw for more than it was. Although this fish will say, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm awesome, which you are, okay? So, um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of, uh, I mean, obviously I can't cover tons and tons of stuff about watercolor but I just kind of wanted to show you how I work a little bit or just kind of the, the, uh, the um, supplies and the uh, equipment I use 
um, so that so that you can kind of delve into the stuff and and create your own stuff. As a matter of fact, with my watercolors and with my oils, I actually buy uh, generic nondescript tubes, metal tubes, uh, you know, like that that look like little tiny toothpaste tubes, and then I re, you know, like decanter my paints um, so that I have them, you know, in these small, beautiful tubes that I can use the way I want to use them. So, uh, does this help? I hope it does because it's not, it's not necessarily talking about the design of a picture book. Okay. Um, like I, I was just kind of showing you how I did the amazing watercolor fish. This book was actually done, you know, a uh, progression from almost black and white to as Ashley becomes more, you know, um, expands her world and, and, uh, you know, plays with uh, her imagination and with, and with her new friend, it just becomes more and more saturated with color. And that was a, a design choice until, you know, the very end, you have, you know, just explosive color, which I absolutely love doing. This is just layers and layers and layers of watercolor. But, um, but, but, um, uh, I was, I, I wanted to just show you, um, that there's just a real passion about the, the toys you use to create stuff. Uh, like I said, Raul III uses ballpoint pens. Uh, I have another friend and she's a very famous, she's won uh, Caldecott's as well. And she's, uh, her name is Denise Fleming and she uh, does her illustrations in, in pulp paper. In other words, when she, she creates the paper and the paper's colored. And so her illustrations are actually, you know, like, paper that dries, you know, on these screens. And so the illustrations are, the paper is just actually the illustration all the way through. And that's really amazing. And I have another friend, uh, Akiko White, who, uh, who illustrates in cake fondant, right? And, oh my God, she's amazing. So uh, I think choosing your um, medium is really, really important. If you're like me, you get a little carried away with everything. But um, even though I get carried away with everything, I, I try to really, really understand and really um, have respect for the brush, for the paint, for the pencil, for the paper, you know, because, uh, because it's all part of your hand. It's all part of your art, right? And, uh, and it's really a privilege to be able to do the work that we do. So, I hope this gives you a little insight into what the studio is like. And uh, we didn't even really talk about the Syntec, which I also use, which is the digital uh, drawing pad and, uh, and those kinds of things. But I think uh, when you use that, it's really important to also have a really visceral feel for traditional medium so that you can kind of uh, approach it from a different perspective and, and really push your digital art uh, to not necessarily match traditional traditional uh, equipment, but to um, maybe do things that no one else has thought of. And that's always, not always the goal, but that sure is fun, right? And uh, whatever you do, if you really love your work, and uh, it will all come together, it will all, you know, gel, your voice will, will come through, and hopefully, you know, your your very own brush that you make or, or pencil becomes part of your voice. And I hope that that happens for you because that has happened for me many, many times. So uh, I will see you guys later. Uh, well, just a couple more things before I go that you should know about picture books. Picture books um, are generally 32 pages, okay? You have a front, spine, and the back. You have in papers, okay? In papers here. The first page is always the title page. And uh, the next page is always the publisher's page and the, uh, the dedication page. And then you start on this page, which is almost always, like it's one, two, three, it's always four, almost always. And so, um, 
like I said, when, when the picture goes across, it's a spread. This is the gutter. And uh, so that is a really important format for picture books for a couple of reasons. One, and I need to show you this. Man, I really wish I had a piece of paper just handy, but I'll, I'll just use. Okay. The reason picture books are 32 pages or increments of eight is this. Okay, so because they're all print, they're printed all on one big piece of paper. So imagine this is the big piece of paper, huge piece of paper that a book is printed on. It has two sides, right? If you fold it like this, now you have four sides. You've doubled it. You fold it again, now you have eight sides. Fold it again, 16, and you fold it again, and you have 32. Imagine this is a really big piece of paper. Okay, when a book is printed, it is printed on one big piece of paper, and then it's folded like this, and then they put it in between the hard cover, you know, front and back. So it's it's like this. And then it's it's in between the two boards, right? And then they trim it like this, this, and this. And that constitutes a picture book. The thing is, sometimes you'll go to a library or you'll buy a book, and very rarely, but but occasionally, you'll you'll see that the edges are still uh, not quite cut apart. They're still they they're still together. And that is because a picture book all comes from one big piece of paper. It's all printed on one piece of paper. But um, it's also important to note that one of the reasons picture books have tended to stay in increments of eight, because it's not as big a deal with printing as it used to be, you know, when uh, before, you know, technology could, could really uh, change the way, you know, the run came out. The reason it still remains at 32, sometimes 40, and rarely 48, is because that is an intrinsic pacing for a picture book. Picture books and, uh, and storybooks are generally read to children who can't read, right? And so you read them uh, this length with that kind of pacing and uh, to them it feels like a song. And I, and I know this, or I noticed it because I was a composer before I was uh, an illustrator. And I noticed that uh, well, pop songs have a 16-beat turnaround and 32-beat turnaround, and so do picture books. Uh, and that is why, I think, to a great extent, little children want to um, be read the same book over and over and over again all the time. Because they think of these books as, these books sound more to them like a song than like other books. So by the time a child starts to read their own books and starts to read chapter books and, uh, um, you know, like uh, novels and things like that, you know, uh, middle grade, uh, they no longer want to hear the same, I mean, they don't want to hear it over and over and over again. If they've read it, they've read it, right? But uh, when you're little uh, and you can't read, you just love hearing the same book over and over again. And that's because there's an innate rhythm and an innate pace to a picture book. So, I mean, you can just go, you know, really deeply into the format of picture books. And that's just one type of children's book. So I just wanted to give you a little insight into kind of what we deal with when we go into this field and how come it's so exciting. I could talk to you about thumbnails and design and uh, I even have stuff all over here that I could show you, but I thought today we could talk a lot about tools and I hope this is something that you really enjoy, okay? If you have any questions about stuff like this, uh, you can email me. My website is carolynflores.com. Just make sure that it, in the subject, uh, before you email me, say that, that you saw me um, on this presentation and that you're asking about, you know, uh, art stuff, so. It's been a pleasure having you in my studio. It really has. And, uh, and I uh, wish the best for you guys, especially during this chaotic time. Catch you later. Bye-bye.